What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There is nothing in the Old Testament about not helping people on the Sabbath. Nothing. All it says is don't work. Don't do your normal work. Does that mean you don't do anything? Of course not. You prepare food for the family, you go visit relatives, you do whatever you want to do. It's just different than the diligent hard work of the, rather, of the rest of the week. They knew what Scripture said. The Pharisees and the scribes knew what Scripture said. Yet they had developed laws, traditions that said the efforts of a physician or the efforts of a relative to help a sick person constitute work and cannot be done on Sabbath. Pretty harsh. But that was the way it was. The rabbis decided that helping someone on the Sabbath was work. They also developed a, uh, an exception, and that was if the person was threatened with imminent death. You could stop the bleeding. Now remember, th there are no medical doctors like we know them today. They didn't even understand the pathology of disease or weren't even close to understanding it. But there were physicians who did whatever they could based upon the knowledge of the time to help people, and there were friends and relatives who came alongside. This was constituted work unless it was to prevent an immediate death. Couldn't be done. Well, they wanted to see Jesus violate their Sabbath. Now keep this in mind. They had their laws to deal with people helping people. They had never seen a healer because there had never been one, right? Never. Never been one. Never in, in redemptive history had there been a person who went around healing everybody. Never had been one. So they didn't have laws about healers. They just had laws about helpers. But they viewed what Jesus did as help, even though never in a healing that Jesus did did He exert any effort. He healed with a word. He healed with a touch. But because it constituted helping someone, they cast it in the category of violation. They wanted Jesus to violate the Sabbath. That's what it says at the end of verse 2. They were watching to see if He would heal Him on the Sabbath so they might accuse Him. They wanted to have reason to accuse Him. They wanted to paint Him as a blasphemer, a Sabbath violator, irreligious, and He would help them do that if He would heal. So they're silently standing there to be the protectors of the Sabbath, hoping and hoping and hoping that He violates the Sabbath. Now there's one little note that Luke adds here, Luke 6, 8 in the parallel account in Luke. Matthew 12 has a parallel account too. Luke adds this, but He knew what they were thinking. Of course. He always knew what people were thinking. It's called omniscience. He knows everything. John 2 says, didn't need anybody to tell Him what was in the heart of a man. He knew what was there. He reads their minds. They had no concern for the man. They could have cared less about the man's disability. They could have cared less about the man's exigencies because of that disability. They just wanted Jesus to look like a blaspheming lawbreaker. Well, He knew what they were thinking, of course. That's the context. That sets the stage. Then comes, we'll call it the question, verses 3 and 4. He said to the man with the withered hand, Get up, come forward. 
Now, the man hasn't said anything. Man hasn't asked for a healing. He just calls him out of the crowd. Hey, you back there with the withered hand, come here. Jesus is the aggressor here. He's not hesitant. He's not reluctant. He's not shy. Get up. Come forward. Luke says it all started when Jesus began teaching. So He's now stopped His teaching. He's read the minds of the Pharisees and the scribes, and He brings the man up to bring this thing to a confrontation. When He brings the man up, Matthew 12.10 in Matthew's account, Matthew says, first, the Pharisees and the scribes ask Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They ask Him the question. He doesn't answer. He doesn't answer. But Matthew says He gave them an analogy. Would you rescue a sheep on the Sabbath? If a sheep was in danger of being wounded or injured, would you rescue a sheep? And of course they would because a sheep has value. If you would... and He knew they would, and they did in that culture. If you would do that, would you not help a person? And so first they pose the question. He responds with the very general kind of analogy of, do you help people on a Sabbath when you would help an animal on the Sabbath? Then He turned the question on them in verse 4. He said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? You asked Me if it's lawful to heal. Let Me rephrase the question and put it to you. Is it lawful to do good or do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or kill it? Oh, that question is so loaded because they were wanting to kill Him. And believe Me, they would have killed Him on a Sabbath if they could have. And He was wanting to do good. Who's really on God's side here? Is it lawful digs the knife in? What does He mean, is it lawful? Is it according to the law of Moses? What does... or the law of God? What does Old Testament Scripture say? Does Old Testament Scripture have anything to say about doing good? They knew the answer. They were experts in the Scripture. They would have thought of Isaiah 1, verse 11. What are your multiplied sacrifices to Me, says the Lord? I've had enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. I'm sick of your external stuff. When you come to appear before Me, who requires of you this trampling of My courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to Me, new moon and Sabbath. The calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I'm sick of your Sabbaths. I hate your new moon festivals, your appointed feasts. They become a burden to Me. I'm weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I'll hide My eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. And He says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from My sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good." So Jesus poses the question to them, is it right to do good on the Sabbath? They would have thought of Isaiah chapter 1, which basically says, I hate your Sabbaths. It's all hypocrisy. I want you to do good to seek justice, verse 17, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Ruthless 
People need to be reproved. Orphans need to be protected. Widows need to be cared for. That's what I want. I want you to do good. I hate your hypocritical Sabbath. That's all the way back in Isaiah's day. They knew that. They also would have known Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 talks about God's attitude toward Sabbaths and toward goodness. Verse 6, is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? This is what I want. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. Then you will cry, and He will say, Here I am, if you remove the yoke from your midst, and the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness, your gloom will become like midday, and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones, and you'll be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose water doesn't fail. Verse 13, if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on My holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord. You better get Sabbath right. You better get it out of your hands and your laws and your rules and your attitudes and into Mine." They knew that. They knew what the Old Testament law said. The question is the obvious question. Is it lawful to do good? Of course. To do harm? No. Is it lawful to save a life? Of course. To kill? No. There they were, full of venom, wanting to do harm and kill someone on the Sabbath, while Jesus wanted to do good and save someone, not because He was on the brink of death, but because of the incapacities that made life so difficult. Our Lord's questions always put His enemies on the horns of a dilemma. What are they going to say? If they say, <clears throat> it is lawful to do good and save a life, then they would be unable to accuse Jesus of any violation, and they would affirm His act of healing as good and right. They don't want to do that. They want Him to be seen as a blasphemer, not one who does righteously. But on the other hand, if they say, uh, it is lawful to do evil and to kill, they would affirm their own merciless wickedness. So they did the only thing they could do. End of verse 4, they kept silent. He did this to them all the time. He just shut their mouths. They knew what the Old Testament said. He framed the extremes, forced them to silence. They knew the Sabbath was of all days for good, not for bad. The real issue here is, the underlying issue is, which of us is honoring God? Am I honoring God with a desire to do good and save a life? Or are you honoring God with a desire to do harm and kill me? Who really represents God here? Do you? Do I? And then he did something for effect. Verse 5, after looking around at them with anger, whoo, dramatic silence, folks. They aren't saying a word. The air is thick with silence. Nobody is breathing. And Jesus stares them down, eyeball to eyeball, looks right at them so nobody mistakes what He's doing, 
and he is angry. That's so interesting. This is the only explicit mention of Jesus being angry in the New Testament. Was He angry at other times? Sure. He cleansed the temple at the beginning of His ministry, the end of His ministry. This is the only time it actually says Jesus was angry. The Old Testament is full of references to God's anger. There are hundreds, twenty times it talks about the anger of the Lord. But this is a rare statement. Explicitly it says Jesus was angry. Angry at what? Unbelief? Rejection? Angry at their devastating apostate religion? Angry at their spiritual pride? Angry at this gross iniquity? This is the severest of sin's expressions, to reject the gospel, to reject grace and goodness. They were merciless, compassionless, brutal, hard-hearted, proud, self-righteous. Yes, God is angry with sin. So is Jesus. But it's so amazingly followed by this statement grieved at their hardness of heart. Anger, orge, a very strong word. Indignation, wrath would be synonyms. It's used in Romans 13 of vengeance, punishment. He was furious. But it also says he was grieved. That means to feel sympathy. These are the juxtaposed attitudes of God as He looks at the obstinate unbeliever angry and grieved at the same time, grieved at their porosis. Porosis, it's a word translated hardness. It's used of marble, hard-hearted. By the way, it, it's used to refer to the disciples in chapter 6, verse 52, and chapter 8, verse 17, so there are times when even His disciples were hard-hearted. But here it's a settled, permanent condition. And it both makes him mad and angry and sad. He is angry at their unbelief and their rejection, and he is sad at the consequence, the necessary condemnation that is to come. Clearly, Scripture teaches human responsibility, doesn't it? Human culpability. Human volition is a reality. Every sinner is guilty for his own sin, culpable for his own sin, will be held guilty before God for rejecting the gospel, rejecting the truth, and will go to hell because of his own unwillingness to embrace the truth. That's the other side of sovereign election, isn't it? Our Lord's anger was mixed with grief. He is angry, yet He is filled with pity. It's like when He arrived at Jerusalem, Matthew 23, 37 and 38. And he wept, Luke 19, 41 to 44. He wept over the city, then he immediately pronounced judgment on it. The paradox, the apparent paradox of sovereign election and human responsibility are matched by the paradox of the Lord's severe anger at those who reject him, and at the same time, severe grief over their necessary condemnation. He is both angry and sad. He finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But nonetheless, He will move to the confrontation. From the question to the confrontation, verse 5, He said to the man, stretch out your hand. No work, by the way, in that action. No work in that command. And He stretched it out and His hand was restored. Can you imagine the buzz that went through the synagogue? People went to their local synagogue. Everybody knew Him. Everybody could see the healing. It must have been a tremendous buzz in that place when that hand just took perfect shape, became fully functional. You would think any reasonable, sensible person, even a Pharisee and a scribe would say, you know what, I think I need to rethink who this person is. Maybe I need to go back and take a look at this again. 
That's just inexplicable. That's just... you just don't go from something like this to a fully functioning hand. It's just... I just need to think about this all over again. No. Luke 6.11 says this, they were filled with rage, rage, anoyas. Nao means to know, anoyas, anao would mean not to know, it's the alpha privative negates, to be devoid of understanding. The simple way to translate it, they were filled with madness. They lost their minds, they were void of understanding. They were at their wit's end. They went over the top, out of control. Their madness is motivated by this hatred of Jesus' teaching that attacks their self-righteous spiritual pride. So they go into paroxysms of uh, psychopathic rage against Him. And Luke also says they then discuss together what they might do to Jesus. I'd like to have heard that conversation. Luke 6, 11, <clears throat> the plot to kill Him now takes on more energy. The plot to kill Him takes on greater momentum. This, dear friends, is Judaism's official response to Jesus. Here it is. We're just into the third chapter in Mark and already we have the official response to Jesus. Kill Him, kill Him, kill Him. So the context is set, the question is posed, the confrontation occurs. And the final word in the story is in verse 6 that we'll call it the conspiracy. They got to do this right, they got to protect themselves, they got to preserve their reputation. They know that he's winning the people superficially. Synagogue must have exploded with wonder over the miracle. They're mad with rage. They start to talk about how to kill him. Somebody gets control of the thing a little bit. And verse 6 says, they went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against Him as to how they might destroy Him. Destroy is the operative word here. Apollomy is the Greek verb, means to utterly destroy, kill. They want to destroy Jesus. They want to obliterate Him. Now what about the Herodians? Who are they? Well, they're not a sect of Judaism. They're not like the Essenes or the Pharisees or... Uh, or the Sadducees, which were Jewish sects. They're not a part of Jewish religion. The Herodians are secularists. Remember now, Herod the Great was an Idumean petty king who ruled at the will of Rome in the land of Israel. And when he died, he divided up Israel into four sections and gave a section to each of his sons, or at least four of his sons, and it was all split in those four ways. There were Jews in Israel who had no interest in religion. They were secularists and they had attached themselves to the Herodian cause, to the cause of Herod the Great and his progeny. They were politically driven, loyal to the Herodian dynasty. Uh, they had found their way into favor with these uh, Herodians, Herod uh, Mantipas, um, Philip the Tetrarch, Archelaus, and uh, they, they were beholden to them probably for reasons of personal gain, personal elevation. They uh, may have been tax collectors, uh, some of them, who uh, were attached to the Herodians because the Herodians were in league with Rome. They were considered by, by the true Jews to be Hellenists, to have been Romanized or somehow influenced by Greek culture. And so they were, they were the seculars who were not friends of the Pharisees. In fact, they were staunch enemies. The Pharisees opposed Hellenism. They had nothing in common with those who were in league with Rome or with the Herodian dynasty. Fascinating it is then that every time the Herodians appear on the pages of the New Testament, it is in alliance with the Pharisees against Jesus, every time. They had nothing in common. They were basically enemies, very religious, very secular, no common ground except that each saw Jesus as a threat. The Pharisees to their religious system, the Herodians to their dynastic power. So they came together to commiserate on Jesus. 
The Jews are now going to pull everybody together because they're going to have to have full cooperation to get Jesus to an execution. And folks, it's a reminder, it's a horrible reminder of the blindness against all reality of false religion, is it not? The contrast between Jesus and the Jewish religious leaders is stark. Contrast between divine truth and human tradition. Contrast between knowledge and madness. A contrast between goodness and wickedness, compassion and indifference, open honesty and hidden deception, divine power and impotence, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. So the storm clouds have begun to gather on the horizon over the head of Jesus. They will break on Him on a hillside outside Jerusalem called Golgotha where He will give His life. But even in death, He triumphs, paying the price for all our sin, rising from the dead for our justification. Father, Your Word again is light to us. It is power and life. We pray, Lord, that uh, You would let that light, that life, that power, that truth break upon dark hearts today, people who have found resistance to the light because they love the darkness, they love their evil deeds. They might be flagrant, open sinners who love the deeds of the flesh. They might be religious, self-righteous, spiritual hypocrites who cling only to pride as their ultimate satisfaction. Whatever the darkness, whatever defines the darkness, darkness it is until the light of Christ shines. May that light shine. May the light of the gospel, the glorious gospel, shine in hearts today, disclosing the deeds of evil, that the sinner might repent, come to the light, be transformed. Confrontation is necessary. It is righteous. It is good. It is compassionate. It is kind. We thank You that among that group of Pharisees there was one named Saul, and You brought the light and shattered his darkness. Lord, we pray that there would be many who in hearing this would rush to the light and flee the damning danger of spiritual darkness, especially those trapped in false religion. Free them by Your grace, we pray, amen.